Across the United States, some of the biggest construction projects in the country are happening right now, and most people have no idea they're underway. From offshore wind farms that stretch for miles out at sea, to a high-speed train that promises to connect Las Vegas to Los Angeles in just over two hours, to new LNG terminals in Louisiana that are quietly turning American gas into a global export. These are not ideas. They're already being built. The U.S. is not just talking about infrastructure anymore, it's building again, and the scale of what's underway might surprise you. Now with that being said, let's begin. If you've ever driven from Los Angeles to Las Vegas on a holiday weekend, you know how that story goes. Six hours on a desert highway, moving at a crawl. But Brightline West is trying to change that. With something the U.S. has been talking about for decades, high-speed rail that actually gets built. This is a private project backed by Brightline, the same company running the passenger rail service in Florida. The plan is to connect Las Vegas to Southern California with 218 miles of track. Built in the median of Interstate 15, trains will run at speeds up to 186 miles per hour, cutting the trip to just over two hours, faster than flying if you include airport security and boarding. After years of delays and regulatory hurdles, construction officially broke ground in April 2024. As of mid-2025, grading and bridge prep are underway near Victor Valley. And Brightline says full-scale track construction will ramp up through the rest of the year. The project is expected to cost around $12 billion, with funding coming from private bonds and a $3 billion grant from the federal government. Once it's complete, the trains will run entirely on electric power with zero direct emissions. If everything stays on track, Brightline West should open by December 2028, a bit too late for the LA Olympics, unfortunately. Still, it's ambitious, but there are still challenges. The terrain through the Mojave is not flat, and the project requires over over 300 permits from state and federal agencies. There's also the question of ridership. Will enough people choose trains over driving or flying? However, the demand is already there. Millions travel between LA and Vegas every year, and the I-15 corridor is one of the most congested inner city routes in the US. If Brightline can deliver a fast, clean, and convenient alternative, it could become the first true high-speed rail success story in the country. But that's still an if. Right now, what they've built is promise and a whole lot of fresh graded desert. Just off the coast of Virginia, one of the largest energy projects in the country is taking shape. It's called Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind, or CVOW for short, and once it's complete, it'll generate 2.6 gigawatts of electricity. That's more than the Hoover Dam, and it doesn't rely on rivers, dams, or reservoirs, just ocean wind. Construction began in November 2023, and as of mid-2025, the project is a little over halfway done. Out of the 176 planned turbines, nearly half of the foundations are already in place, and the underwater cables that connect them are being laid right now. The construction work spans miles of seafloor, and it's all tied together through substations being staged on shore at the Portsmouth Marine Terminal. To manage equipment this large, turbine blades longer than a football field, steel towers that rival city buildings, Dominion Energy had to upgrade the port itself. They're also building a specialized vessel called the Charybdis, the first of its kind to be flagged and operated in the U.S. Without it, they'd be stuck using foreign ships, and thanks to federal law, that's not a simple workaround. But size and complexity are not the only challenges here. The cost has jumped from $9.8 billion to about $10.7 billion. Steel tariffs, inflation, and project delays have all played a role. Dominion is responsible for anything over $10.3 billion, but ratepayers will still carry a significant share of the total. If the timeline holds, it will be fully operational by the end of 2026, feeding clean power to over 660,000 homes. While Virginia's wind farm is all about raw power and scale, New York is going in with a more technical approach. Sunrise Wind is a 924-megawatt offshore wind farm being built about 30 miles off the coast of Long Island. It's a joint project between Ersted and Eversource, and what sets it apart is its use of high-voltage direct current, HVDC transmission. That's a first for a U.S. offshore wind project, and it's meant to move electricity over long distances 
more efficiently with less loss along the way. Construction on the project officially began in 2024. Most of the foundations are being staged in Europe, then shipped across the Atlantic. Some of the onshore components, like the grid connection site in Brookhaven, are already under development. Full-scale offshore work is expected to ramp up through 2025 and into 2026. If it stays on track, Sunrise Wind will be operational by 2027, but that timeline depends on a lot of moving parts. Rising supply chain costs have already forced the cancellation of other nearby offshore projects, and Sunrise Wind is under pressure to prove it can be done without breaking the budget. Still, New York State is betting big on offshore wind. The state has a goal of 9,000 megawatts by 2035, and Sunrise Wind is a key part of that plan. When it's finished, the project is expected to power around 600,000 homes. It's not as large as CVOW, but in terms of complexity, it might be an even bigger challenge. In Detroit, a massive international bridge is quietly taking shape, and when it's finished, it's expected to carry more trade than any other land crossing in North America. The Gordie Howe International Bridge connects Detroit, Michigan to Windsor, Ontario. It's a six-lane cable-stayed bridge with dedicated lanes for trucks, passenger vehicles, and even pedestrians. The total span is over 2.5 kilometers and the main towers are now fully built, standing 220 meters tall, almost the height of the Eiffel Tower. Unlike other bridges between the US and Canada, this one is publicly owned. It's managed by a Canadian agency called the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority and built by a private consortium under a long-term contract. The total cost? About $4.4 billion. As of summer 2025, the deck sections from both sides have met in the middle. All major structural components are in place and finishing work is underway. The bridge is on track to open to traffic by the end of the year. The current Ambassador Bridge, built in 1929, is privately owned and nearing the end of its useful life. It also represents a single point of failure for billions in cross-border goods. The new bridge adds redundancy and modern infrastructure, including pre-clearance facilities on both sides to speed up freight. Of course, getting to this point has not been easy. The project was delayed for years by lawsuits from the Ambassador Bridge's owner, and land acquisition on the U.S. side triggered more legal battles. Even now, community groups in southwest Detroit are raising concerns about pollution, traffic, and how the surrounding neighborhoods are being reshaped. Still, the economic case is hard to argue with. About 25% of trade between the U.S. and Canada passes through Detroit, and this bridge is designed to handle the next generation of freight faster, cleaner, and with more security. By the end of 2025, trucks rolling across this bridge will be doing more than just crossing a river. They'll be linking two countries with one of the most heavily used land connections in the Western Hemisphere. While some parts of the U.S. are building clean energy from wind and sun, others are doubling down on natural gas, and nowhere is that more visible than along the Louisiana Gulf Coast. The United States is sitting on more natural gas than it can use. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the country holds over 3,000 trillion cubic feet of technically recoverable natural gas. Most of it comes from three major regions, the Permian Basin in West Texas, the Haynesville Shale in Louisiana, and the Marcellus region in the Northeast. Combined, they've turned the U.S. into one of the world's largest natural gas producers. And since 2023, the top export of liquefied natural gas. Right now, some of the biggest LNG terminals on the planet are under construction along Louisiana's Gulf Coast. These aren't just storage tanks and pipelines. They're massive export hubs designed to chill natural gas to negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit, load it onto tankers, and send it halfway across the world. The Gulf Coast offers everything these companies need, access to shale gas via pipeline, deep water ports, experienced labor, and wide open space for massive facilities. The biggest of the bunch is Woodside Energy's proposed facility in Cameron Parish called Louisiana LNG. It's expected to cost up to $17.5 billion, with a planned capacity of 16.5 million metric tons of LNG per year. That's enough to make it one of the largest gas 
export terminals in the world once it's complete. Nearby, Venture Global's CP2 LNG project is even larger. It received final approval from U.S. regulators in 2025 and will eventually ship up to 28 million metric tons annually. That alone would put it ahead of any other U.S. export facility on the books today. The reason for this sudden wave of expansion is pretty simple. Global demand. After the energy crisis that followed the Russian invasion of Ukraine, European and Asian countries started looking for alternatives to Russian gas. The U.S. has been filling that gap, and Louisiana's ports are at the center of it. In South Texas, a new bridge just opened that's been in the making for nearly a decade. The Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge officially opened to traffic on June 28, 2025, marking the end of a long, complicated construction process and the beginning of a new chapter for one of America's busiest energy ports. The Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge stretches across the ship channel, linking downtown Corpus Christi to the northern port and highways beyond. The original bridge, built in the 1950s, was not built for modern super tankers or modern safety standards. The new one is bigger, taller, and much more advanced. The new bridge stands 538 feet tall with a 1,661-foot main span, making it the longest cable-stayed bridge in the United States. It now allows ultra-large cargo ships to enter the port without restriction, something the old 1950s-era bridge simply couldn't handle. But getting here has been a long story. Construction began back in 2016, and for years the project was bogged down by engineering disputes, contract changes, and safety concerns. In 2022, TxDOT removed the original builder over structural concerns, and the entire project had to be reassessed. At one point, it was not clear when or even if the bridge would be completed. That makes its opening a big deal, not just because of what it means for trade and infrastructure, but because it restores public confidence after nearly a decade of setbacks. The demolition of the old bridge will now begin clearing the channel for larger vessels and opening the door to future port expansion. This is not just a transportation upgrade. The port depends on this project to handle bigger volumes of oil, gas, and other exports. Without the extra height and width, growth at the port would eventually hit a wall. After nine years of waiting, the new Harbor Bridge is finally open. And for the city of Corpus Christi, it's not just a new landmark. It's a long overdue answer to the region's economic future. In the middle of downtown Austin, something is rising that doesn't quite match the city's usual skyline. It's not another mid-rise condo or a glassy tech campus. This one's different. It's called Waterline, and when it's finished, it'll be the tallest building in Texas. At 1,031 feet, Waterline is designed to hold a little bit of everything. Apartments, offices, a hotel, and retail space stacked into a super tall tower that stands more than twice the height of the Texas State Capitol. Construction started in 2023, and by mid-2025, the building had already passed the previous record holder in the state. The location is not random. Austin has become one of the fastest growing cities in the country, with population and investment pouring in from all directions. But that growth has come with pressure on housing, infrastructure, and city planning. Waterline is trying to do all of it in one vertical move. It's backed by Lincoln Property Company and Cairoi Residential, and the footprint covers three city blocks along Waller Creek. The building includes over 700,000 square feet of office space, more than 350 apartments, and a luxury hotel operated by One Hotels. Still, some residents worry that towers like Waterline are pushing Austin toward the kind of skyline more familiar in New York or Miami, and it could change the character of the city. Either way, it's happening, and when it's done, Waterline won't just change the skyline, it'll redefine the center of gravity for one of America's fastest-growing urban cores. While most of the attention has gone to wind, gas, and rail, something else quietly came back online in 2025, nuclear. In July 2025, work officially resumed on the VC Summer Nuclear Expansion Project in South Carolina. After being abandoned in 2017 at nearly 50% completion, the project is now being revived as part of a broader federal push to expand nuclear energy capacity in the U.S. 
The plan includes finishing Units 2 and 3, both pressurized water reactors that use the same AP-1000 design seen in the recently completed Vottle plant in Georgia. The Department of Energy and several private firms have stepped in with new financing and risk-sharing models to get the work moving again. So why restart this project now? Well, that's because the U.S. needs stable baseload power, and nuclear is still one of the only options that delivers it without relying on the weather or imported fuel. With wind and solar providing intermittent generation and natural gas exports on the rise, nuclear is being re-evaluated as a way to balance the grid without increasing emissions. The original project collapse cost billions and left taxpayers footing the bill for a plant that didn't produce a single kilowatt. Kilowatt. But the technology itself wasn't the issue. Execution was. The hope this time is that with lessons learned from Vodal, clearer project management, and stronger federal backing, VC Summer can finally be completed. If it succeeds, it'll be the first major U.S. nuclear build brought back from the dead, and it could signal a shift in how the country handles nuclear going forward, not as a risky bet, but as a functional piece of the long-term energy mix. Now that we've looked at each project on its own, it's easier to see the bigger picture. These are not one-off builds. Taken together, they represent a major shift in how the U.S. is approaching infrastructure through scale, through specialization, and by betting big on long-term value. The U.S. has no shortage of ideas, but follow-through has often been the weak point. A few of these projects, like the Corpus Christi Harbor Bridge, have already been delivered. Others are still in the early stages, and whether they meet their deadlines, budgets, and promises is something worth watching closely. Either way, it's clear that something has shifted. After decades of slow movement on major builds, the U.S. is constructing again, at scale, across sectors, and in ways that could reset the country's infrastructure baseline for the next 30 to 40 years. So what do you think? Which of these mega projects do you believe will actually deliver on its promises? Which one seems the most likely to stall, go over budget, or quietly disappear? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.